everyone. Welcome to live with okclarity.com and for joining the live stream tonight. Um, tonight's live is going to provide you with some clarity and that's going to be around parenting survival skills and how to talk to kids about finances when budgets are tight. So welcome and thank you for joining. Tonight's live stream is going to be 20 minutes and at about the 15 minute mark, I'm going to stop and allow for questions. So please go ahead and feel free to put those in the chat and I won't acknowledge them immediately, but I will make sure that I get to as many as I can as we go um, towards that 15 minute mark. So welcome. I do want to give a brief disclaimer, and that is just that everything that I talk about tonight is just for educational and for entertainment purposes only. So this is not meant to be advice, medical, or mental health advice. So thank you. My name is Sarah Fisher Sanford, and I'm a therapist. I practice in California. I work with adults primarily who have a history of trauma. And um, a lot of the clients that I work with are parents or grandparents, and so this topic has been something that has come up a little bit more um, recently in my practice. So um, I want to talk a little bit about why I think that this financial topic is really important right now. And that is, and I'm just going to speak to California because this is where I'm at. And right now we have 5 million people in California who are living below the poverty line. So that's about 14% of our population. And when we look at it from a slightly larger perspective, the Public Policy Institute tells us that about one third of kids who are living in California are qualified as either poor or near poor when we look at finances. So that's one third of kids in California, my home state. And I'm sure that that number is fairly similar across the nation. And then especially, I think that this topic is important because um, most kids are either out of school or will be out of school. And so that's a time when parents have more interaction with their kids. And also because having kids at home of course, is a little bit more expensive. You may not have school lunches and other things that are normally covered costs. And so having the financial means to provide a really good summer for your kids is absolutely important. So um, I also want to say that on a more personal note, or at least in regard to my own practice, um, so many of my clients are adults, survivors of trauma, and so they are often very concerned about how any difficulty that their own kids experience may be impactful or be even traumatizing. And so I want to say that it's one of those moments where I tell my clients, don't worry, don't freak out. Um, we don't traumatize our kids solely for needing to be on a budget. Our kids are not traumatized because of um, just solely being having financial um, constraints. So just know as we talk about this, and if you are one of my clients out there, that the most important part of taking good care of your children and making sure that they don't grow up with a childhood of any trauma is going to be with all of those things that are not monetary, um, providing a safe and secure environment, giving your kids all the love and the care that they need, and the money piece, it can be challenging, but it can be a small aspect of your child's lives, regardless of what your financial situation looks like now or as they grow up. So tonight, I'm gonna to talk about sort of three areas in regard to this. So I wanna talk about um, you know ways that we can start to instill our values in regard to finances from a very child-friendly perspective. And so I think a good place to start, especially with young kids, although for all of us, having this can be a little bit helpful, and that is by using a chore chart in the home. And a chore chart can be as simple as like a dry erase board, you can make a poster board, 
and I know um, that toy brand Melissa and Doug has a great one for like around $20 on Amazon um, and it has some of some really simple and basic chores that kids can do um, within the house and I think as adults we also know that we can benefit from having a reward when we do things well and when we complete things so it really doesn't change all that much if we're talking about kids of different ages or you know adults ourselves so the idea of using a chore chart is not just for behavior but it starts to slowly instill our values when it comes to the work and to the reward we get for completing that work so if you are to for example start using a chore chart with your kids when they're young so maybe it's not necessarily based on money itself but it does start to tie together the concept of being rewarded for hard work and also for knowing that rewards and happiness for that hard work does not have to be attached to a dollar amount. So I'm gonna give a couple of tips about starting to use a chore chart. And that is that you wanna give your kids some things that they can work for that are kinda of like freebies and you also want to have things on that chore chart that are a little bit more of a challenge. So the reason that we do that from a behavioral perspective is that we want kids to see that for the work that they do, they are rewarded and we don't want to set them up for failure. So if you were to say put three or four chores on that chore chart, give maybe the first two or so as like freebies, things that they're accustomed to doing anyway things that are easy for them and that starts them to get excited about working and then being rewarded and then at, over time um, you can either add things that are a little bit harder or you can add more things on that chart always knowing that those freebies we don't tell them that of course but knowing that that means that they have some success we're going to always set them up for success then they'll learn to work hard for a reward and I think that it's important that, especially at a young age, that we don't tie that reward to money, especially when times when budgets are tight. And if you think about what the kids in your household may value the most, it's probably things that don't cost money. So rewards can be extra time with TV, can be who gets to pick the movie, who gets to pick dinner, who gets to spend extra time with one of the parents, even saying like, okay, we get to stay up 10 minutes past bedtime tonight. Somebody gets to have a friend over or a sleepover or a slumber party. Um, even getting to pick where they go for an ice cream cone. From kids, these things can be free or almost free. And these rewards can be really motivating. And it's always important to make a big deal out of it. So if the kids are able to either make most of their chores and then be rewarded or all of them and then be rewarded. As a parent, just be consistent and you'll be able to tie hard work to rewards and then even slowly incorporate that as grown-ups, we do the same thing. We work hard and then we are rewarded. Sometimes our rewards as adults are different and you can explore that when it's age appropriate. But in the, again, in the very beginning, all we're doing is tying hard work to a reward and making sure that kids know that rewards are not always financial and that those rewards that are not financial are probably gonna be the most fun, okay? So um, just wanted to jump over to a separate topic and that is when you start to you know, have kids that are slowly becoming old enough to understand a little bit more about the concept of money. So think of this as an opportunity to incorporate some financial literacy. So to, of course, depends on the age of the kids, but when they're young, I would suggest doing things, you know, sitting down, counting change, knowing how many quarters in a dollar, doing a little bit of math. And when you start to incorporate that, you can tell kids, okay, so th this month we are able to earn up to, and don't give a big number, but let's say up to four quarters or up to one dollar. And then you can explain to kids that this isn't one type of reward. Sometimes we're rewarded financially, sometimes we're not. 
We're going to slowly learn and understand what money is, how to use it, and do that from a perspective of we're just educating and we're not adding a pressure or a stress in regard to finances. It's just a piece of education. It is a piece of our lives and it's a piece of how we can be rewarded, but it's not the big exciting rewards. I think kids, especially if you use chore chart, in addition to financial literacy, age appropriate, that you're really gonna be able to instill those values that regardless of however many quarters that you have in that dollar, that some of the most exciting pieces of being rewarded is um, you know, the things that we do for our family and the things that we do that are fun and exciting and that financial literacy is an educational piece and that we slowly allow kids to see that maybe grown-ups are rewarded in this way a little bit more. But again, always incorporating that. We wanna be educated about how money works. We wanna understand it sort of from a math perspective and that sometimes there is, and if there's always maybe a limit on how much we can have um, you know, in regard to that financial piece and swooping right back in with the important component, knowing that the biggest reward that we get for our hard work, even if that money piece is capped or we have to be mindful of how many quarters or dollars that we spend, that there's no limit on the rest of the reward, which is, you know, being loved, being safe, being cared for, and always attention. Attention is gonna be a really good way of rewarding kids. Um, then I think there's another piece um, that I wanted to incorporate, and that is that, um, you know, as kids get older, it's gonna be hard, I think, to not have some, make say, limits on what spending is. And I wanna give an example of how, even as kids get older, you don't have to add financial pressure to be able to indicate that there's a limit. And I'll give an example. If you're a parent, sometimes incorporating a budget can lead to pressure, feel shameful, get that parent guilt. So use the example of a staycation. Um, I know that during COVID, a lot of us became very aware of this term, but I think it's important just to say that if this summer that you're one of these people in California who are living, um, you know, around that poverty line that your kids don't have to go without and with the staycation make a big deal out of it right you don't have to spend money on airfare you don't have to spend money on going out to, for meals you get to spend time and you can save things for that staycation that make it just as fun just as exciting and just as rewarding so I know here in California, there's certain um, weekends every month where museums are free. Parks are always a great place to go. Get a kite, fly a kite, do something that you don't normally do. We are so lucky here in the Bay Area to have the beach, even though it's cold, but we can do sand castles. But it's about giving kids some agency, meaning that they can help with understanding what those rewards may be. And it is always about making a big deal out of it. So whether it is a staycation or it's a reward for a chore chart, the most important factor is to instill that there is a reward for hard work, that that reward does not have to be financial. And in fact, the rewards that are not financial are the most exciting. And you're gonna do that as a parent, not by coming from a place of guilt, but instead by knowing that that staycation is going to be just as memorable, just as rewarding, and just as impactful as being able to take kids on something that may be expensive, for example. So I'm um, going to just check for a couple of questions in the Instagram feed. Thank you. So um, just wanted to um, give an extra couple of tips. And that is that I know that here in the Bay Area, there are a lot of different ways where um, we can also incorporate things that are not particularly expensive as extra little, um, let's say, bonuses. 
So um, I think it's important to go online and on from a Facebook group would be a great way and look at the no buy, no like as a no buy, no purchase groups. And I know here in the Bay Area, and I'm sure everywhere, there are groups where all kinds of people that are role models, parents, um, grandparents that have kids really can band together as a community to um, not only just gift things to each other, but share ideas about non-financial rewards that can be, you know, really exciting. And that, again, as a community, that we can not only share ideas, but we can share items that we have within our homes, things that maybe our kids aren't playing with or things that they have grown out of or, you know, kids just being disinterested. And so those no buy groups, which can be on Facebook or can be in other ways on social media, social media can be really helpful like it is tonight. And us coming together as a community, we can also go and support each other and also support that we don't need to have a financial reward for, um, you know, all of the hard work and for all the excitement that we have coming up this summer. So thanks again. I hope that tonight I provided a little bit of clarity about how to talk with kids in an age appropriate way um, about finances, a little bit about financial literacy, about parents not feeling guilty regardless of what your budget may be, and also knowing that the most important pieces of um, avoiding childhood trauma or anything else you may be worried about in regard to your kids is just the basics. Love them, care for them, provide stability, and that's going to be the most important way of showing a reward, and that will be lifelong. Um, thanks again for joining me. My name again is Sarah Fisher Sanford, and I am a therapist in California. You can find more information about me on okclarity.com. Have a lovely night.